uh, hour of 7 o'clock having arrived, I'm going to call the council to order. Let the roll reflect that all council members are present and a quorum has been established. Tonight we're going to begin our city council meeting by uh, recognizing employees who have uh, served the great city of Hastings and our residents for uh, some period of years. And we're going to go through a presentation. I will ask the council to please come in front of the Diaz as we uh, congratulate each of the uh, uh, employee that's going to be recognized tonight. So why don't we just get ahead and get in front of the, the Diaz, okay? Yes, Your Honor and Council, um, members of the audience, staff, um, pleased to see such a full house here tonight. If you Google the word teamwork, you get about 101 million results with quotes and images, articles. And um, if you read any leadership book or go to any leadership training, talks, there's bound to be mentioned about the importance of teamwork. And when you put both the team and the work into teamwork, great things happen, and that's what we see with our staff. And today is one of my favorite meetings not just because it's the last one of the year, um, but it's because I get to stand here before you all and be part of a recognition of our staff um, and their years of service. I've had the good fortune to have these folks share their time with me and their expertise, and I will tell you, they are just something else. They're creative, smart, talented group of people. The Hastings community is very well served. Tonight, over 360 years of service will be honored this evening. While not everybody will be here with us tonight, I hope you will join me in recognizing their contributions. We're gonna start with five years of service. Uh, we have Randall Gray, who's one of our police reservists. He isn't able to join us tonight. We have Ryan Klein, one of our police officers. Yes, if you want to go and, and shake the hands of the council. And then we will do a group photo at the end. Um, we have PJ Lippert. Is PJ here? PJ is one of our paid on call fire and EMS staff celebrating five years. <laughs> William Pope. Is William here today? Okay, five years. One of our fire and EMS staff. Robert Wargo, is Robert here? Robert, what'd you do? <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly he appears. Okay. Ryan McGraw, is Ryan here tonight with us? Ryan wasn't able to make it. Ryan, um, he's been, he's a Five years as a paid on call, but he's also um, four years as a full-time staff in the fire and EMS department. Uh, moving on to 10 years, Kathy Belisle. Kathy, in our police department. And as much as she wants me to pass her by, Julie Flatten from administration, 10 years of service. <laughs> Justin Fortney, where's Justin? Justin's our city planner and HPC specialist. <laughs> Chad Jensen, their fire EMS. Chad is 10 years as a paid on call, five years as a full time. He's not here tonight. Um, Adam Schumacher in our IT department. Adam, 10 years. <laughs> and Jamie Stevens. I saw Jamie. Jamie is one of our fire captains. He's 10 years as a paid on call. Al Storley. 
<laughs> Al's not able to make it tonight. He's been our fire inspector for 10 years, but he's been with the department for 32 years. So, yeah. And I know John Townsend wasn't able to make it tonight. John is 10 years as our um, assistant fire and EMS director, 17 as a paid on call member. Here for 10 years is Jesse Vile. He's one of our park keepers, and he's a he's a just a great guy. And uh, he wasn't able to make it tonight. So um, thank you to all of our 10-year service members. Moving on to 15 years, we have um, two of the management team members that I'm just privileged to get to work with. We have Nick Egger, 15 years as he's our public works director. <laughs> and John Hensman. 15 years, community development. <laughs> 20 years. 20 years. 20 years. Deep Chris, 20 years. <laughs> now we've got some folks that kind of wear two hats. So they're serving, they're um, getting an award for 20 years as a paid on call member of the fire and EMS direct, uh, department. We've got Craig Latch. Craig Latch is 11 years. <laughs> Craig is one of our full timers, 11 years as full time. We've got Mark Knoll, also 11 years as full time, 20 years. Um, and it's Chris Paulson here tonight. Chris Paulson's been with us for 20 years, 14 years as a full-timer, and he's currently one of our captains. <laughs> All right, 25 years. Billy Mac, Billy McNamara, 25 years in our public works department. Gary Rudy. Gary Rudy is also with our Public Works Department. 25 years. <laughs> All right. 30 years. 30 years, folks. We've got two um, that are celebrating this year. First one is Bruce Gandrew. 30 years with our Fire and EMS <laughs> Department. Mark Piney, our public works superintendent, 30 years. <laughs> so um, now I think the mayor wants to say a few words before we take a picture. I want to uh, direct these remarks tonight to, to our uh, employees who are here and those who are not here, uh, to all the city employees, uh, since tonight we're recognizing many of you for your wonderful contributions to the citizens of our community. You know, B.C. Forbes once said, Christmas is a tonic for our souls. It moves us to think of others rather than ourselves. And as I ponder the meeting of this, I am reminded of the tremendous commitment of our city employees to the betterment of our Hastings citizens. Effective public service requires us to think of others rather than ourselves. And as we work together to provide a better quality of life for our residents, all of us as employees of the city of Hastings, especially you, must remember that what we do, all of us in this room, as employees of the city of Hastings, we impact lives. We change lives. No matter what department that you work for, 
no matter what your task, you have the ability to impact our residents' lives. What a true gift that is, an opportunity that is. So on behalf of myself and on behalf of the Hastings City Council, we want to wish you, all of you, a happy holiday. We want to thank you for your valuable service to the community of Hastings. We are very proud of the accomplishments that many of you have brought to our great city. And as we close out this past year, let us celebrate the productive 2017 year that we just had and look forward to making 2018 even better. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. And now we're going to go for a photo. Okay. Join you as soon as we can. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that is the highest motion. <laughs> Couldn't get a second on that. Okay, I'm going to call on uh, Chief Schaefer to come up uh, to give a presentation. Chief, welcome to the meeting. Glad to have you here. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, tonight, unfortunately, uh, uh, our uh, Public Safety Advisory Commission member, Patty McCauley, is not here. At least I didn't see her in the audience. So uh, she said she was going to be here, so I don't know if something came up. But uh, tonight we're just recognizing uh, Patty for her six years of service on the Public Safety Advisory Commission. Uh, for those of you that don't uh, know a lot about the commission, it's an advisory group to the council that advises and acts as a liaison between uh, our public safety police department and a fire department. And some of the projects that they uh, are primarily responsible for is uh, our National Night Out. If you've had an opportunity to, uh, uh, to engage in your neighbors and your neighborhoods and also the Lions Park event that we had this past summer. They've also assisted with the police, or I'm sorry, the police department open house, the fire department open house. And in addition to assisting us with interviews when we interview new, new employees for our respective departments and uh, in uh, 
and some policy issues. One, a couple in, uh, in particular from the police department perspective was the uh, body camera uh, project and also our dangerous dog ordinance. So they do play a vital role in decision making uh, when we bring those forth. So uh, for her service, we'd be recognizing her uh, for six years of service and I'll uh, present her with the certificate the next time I come across her. Okay. Thank right. you. Thank Chief. you. Appreciate that presentation. The next I'll recognize uh, Chris Je Jenkins, our uh, parks director. Chris, welcome. I'll wear my name tag next time. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members. Um, much like the chief, I'm here to recognize a commissioner who's uh, been with the city, served the city for six years. Uh, Jordy Polina, come on up, bud. Um, Jordy has served, like I said, for six years with the Parks and Recreation Commission, uh, being an advocate for the citizens of Hastings, an ambassador for the city, an ambassador for the Parks and Recreation Department as well. Uh, many items such as parkland dedication when new developments come up run through the Parks and Recreation Commission, park improvement requests, uh, if you're familiar with the uh, Veterans Baseball Park uh, press box, that was a park improvement request that was brought to the Parks and Recreation Department, started that process through the Parks and Rec Commission and any other variety of uh, park improvement requests that come through. Also, they help us out with uh, design and layout for new playgrounds, redevelopment of playgrounds. Uh, some of them are involved with uh, the comprehensive planning processes as well. So the citizen advisory commissions that we have serve a, a very important role for us here in the city of Hastings. We appreciate their service very much, sir. Uh, thank you. My pleasure. I appreciate it. If you want to say anything, you're up. Good. All right. <laughs> there you go, bud. Appreciate it. Jordan, would you like to say a few words? No. <laughs> oh, okay. That's okay. Thank you for your service. It means a lot. <laughs> the city of Hastings really appreciates the works of our volunteers and the dedication you bring to the job. And uh, it's important work. And uh, it's greatly appreciated, not only here at this DS, but uh, from the citizens of our community. So thank you very much for your work. Uh, next council, we have uh, a presentation. We have Dakota County Commissioner Mike Slavic, who is here tonight to give us a, uh, a brief uh, update of what's going on with the county. And we appreciate, Commissioner, you being here this evening to uh, give us your annual report. Welcome to the meeting. I noticed when you walked in here, you almost took a seat up here. Yeah, right. Yeah, it used to be in there, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, good evening, Mayor, Council Members, City Staff, uh, and those in the audience and, and watching on TV. Uh, as what the Mayor had stated, this is my annual, I guess my fifth annual update to uh, the City of Hastings on what's happening at Dakota County. And I do have a PowerPoint, sorry for those in, on the Council that you have to look backwards if you, if you, if you choose to see this. And, and really this is mostly an update just to, to give of what's been happening in Dakota County in the last uh, uh, year as well as uh, looking forward what we have. And so I just wanted to, to share with all of you uh, Throughout the first half of 2017, Dakota County uh, was in the process of uh, leaving the County Transit Improvement Board, commonly known as CTIB, which is the quarter percent sales tax that was uh, collected amongst uh, five of the seven counties in the metro area to go into a pot that went for transit in the metro. Uh, by leaving that organization in June of this past year, we are now able to have 100% local control of that quarter percent, uh, whereas in the past, the uh, roughly 16.6 .6 million a year was we, Dakota County was getting somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of that to be able to use for Dakota County projects now effective October 1 uh, 100 percent of that is being used for projects in Dakota County uh, going back to the, the very bottom one there the city and the county did have its very first transportation workshop earlier this fall and with that you're well aware of that but the audience may not be aware of that how important it is to shop local every day but especially now that those dollars that you do spend in Dakota County stay in Dakota County and are able to improve our county road system and with that as was said we enacted a local sales tax that is able to that same quarter percent we did not raise taxes and we're able to maintain those dollars just be able to keep them in Dakota County in 2017 we uh, preserved 42 miles of pavement uh, with West restoration and then did 40, 53 road projects totaling almost, 50, almost $73 million. Uh, we approved a maintenance facility study which does have uh, impact on our um, Empire campus, our uh, Hastings and uh, 
uh, Farmington transportation plants, as well as some of our park maintenance facilities. Uh, with that, we did a, uh, approve a park visitor and a natural resource plan for our park system, as well as uh, the, the natural resource restoration of our 5,500 acres of land that is uh, within the Dakota County Park System. Uh, next, we did go and uh, continue on our efforts with the Metropolitan Council reform, uh, as I think I've shared here in past uh, years of the update. Uh, Dakota County, as well as the city, has kind of love-hate relationships with the Metropolitan Council, and there are, there are many positive things that go with that working relationship, but without a, uh, an elected voice or a, um, even a little bit different with appointed elect officials, you, uh, we have a little different, different take on that in terms of, of some of the requirements that are put on by a, um, a organization that's appointed by whoever the governor is at the time. And then lastly, we did have, a, I felt a very positive working relationship with the transportation workshop this year, hoping to have future ones down the line with the city and the county. Uh, going back to uh, speaking with Tom Novak from his dime on the city council, he's pretty sure that we have never had a workshop at the city of Hastings with Dakota County and staff, uh, at least in the 40 plus years that he's been involved in either the city or the county. Uh, so I think that was a great working uh, opportunity given the fact that um, most other cities in Dakota County have something like this on a very regular basis. Um, next, moving on to the budget, just wanted to share a couple of things. Obviously, uh, uh, the county, uh, just like the city, goes and, and starts this process early. We start our budget process in February, uh, and officially last week on December 12th approved our budget. And uh, with that, you know, we have a lot of pressures like all of you do for demands of residents as well as the, um, you know, just the demands that happen with uh, various state mandates and uh, the growth that does go with that. Uh, so we certainly felt that this was a, a fiscally disciplined long-term budget that also was respectful of the uh, tax dollars. And some highlights of this budget is next year you'll note our, our transportation budget is smaller, just under 56 million, and a lot of that is the preparation with the new dollars with the now uh, sales tax. We'll actually be ramping up our transportation for the next couple years. We've uh, just about doubled what we'll be putting into our projects in the next five years after next year. We have to certainly hire new engineers and, and that to be able to work on those construction projects. Uh, next thing that will certainly impact the city of Hastings and, and, the, and its residents is uh, County Road 46 from Pine Street all the way to 52 is going to be uh, resurfaced next year. It's going to take uh, quite a while. It's a $4 million project uh, to be able to do that and that's going to be from Pine to 52. Uh, the plan is to start that project after school gets out with Hastings Schools and has to be done by the uh, September 1st because the intersection of 42 and 55 is going to have some reconstruction starting September 1st. So we don't want to block everybody heading west out of town two ways at the same time. So one will be done uh, first uh, part of summer and then the second one will be summer into fall. Um, one of the things that I just want to focus on uh, uh, that we've really put an initiative into is our housing and homeless. Um, it was a year ago now that we had some area churches in the Apple Valley Egan area that went and, and realized that as much as Dakota County was doing some great things, uh, we still had a homeless uh, issues that we have not really been able to address. So uh, some churches last year, we had a really cold spell, opened up their, their buildings for um, uh, homeless people within Dakota County. We ended up realizing that was about double the number of individuals that we thought were uh, homeless in, uh, in all of Dakota County. Uh, so we've actually went and have dedicated a million dollars in new resources to addressing our housing and homelessness issues within Dakota County. Uh, and one of those things that we've been able to do is partner with a lot of those churches that took the lead last year. And we now have a, um, which will be a permanent temporary winter shelter. So we have 50 beds of a uh, shelter that goes, will go from November 1st until uh, March 1st. 42 of those 50 beds were used in the month of uh, November with about a quarter um, of those uh, imp uh, in residents actually had full-time employment and we had about 30 to almost 35 percent had some sort of employment and we're still sleeping on cots in one of the churches in Apple Valley. So uh, it has been something that we really addressed that but as uh, the year went on we created a uh, homeless task force with Dakota County and one of the things that we decided with that was we chose not to go and do what uh, our peers in Hennepin and uh, Ramsey have done with building an emergency shelter year round, you know, to the tunes of millions of dollars because we really felt that um, Dakota County is a little bit different situation and we wanted to really try to focus on addressing the root of the problem rather than just a temporary one night, night after night after night. Uh, so there's going to be a lot more um, systematics and, and uh, research into how that is going to go about with those individuals working to try to find the appropriate resources uh, and that's where the remainder 
of those resources will be coming from. Next thing in our budget that was just approved is we will see a uh, major renovation of Pleasant Hill Library in Hastings and Heritage Library in Lakeville. Uh, that will include an addition, expansion onto the, um, the city library uh, uh, at Pleasant Hill as well as a, um, just a totally redesign of the property to the tune of about three and a half million dollar renovation on that. Phase one of the maintenance study that we talked about is uh, uh, happening. Of course, that is not the first steps of Hastings uh, in there, but there's gonna be some expansion to Empire Township. And then our last point in there within our, our budget, we did go into a 79% reduction in our regional rail levy. So if you see on your Dakota County taxes, you'll have two taxes, a Dakota County tax and a regional rail tax. It is our intent to eliminate the Dakota County regional rail tax entirely. For an average home, that's about a $9 tax. And uh, we're, we're doing a 79% per, uh, reduction for 2018. And then we will come to a point within the next two to three years where that will actually be uh, eliminated entirely. And a lot of that is due to that sales tax that was able to cover some of those costs. Just want to briefly show we have a we did pass a $370 million budget. You can see the green and blue parts of, the, of that towards the left is actually the operating budget. And then the gray area is all of our construction and transportation projects. Uh, the capital improvement with that. Of that $250 million is actually people and the services that Dakota County provides. Uh, that is pretty consistent with where we've been before. Uh, uh, all of this, I should add, is uh, uh, something that we are very proud of the fact that our uh, total property tax levy, that's all 87 counties at the very end there in the red is Dakota County. So uh, for the third year in a row, Dakota County will have the lowest uh, property tax levy of your county portion. And a lot of the major reasons for that is we are also now in our third year of being 100% debt free. So, so fortunately for that, as we're able to take those initiatives uh, and addressing some of the needs of our communities like housing and homelessness, we're also able to be very good stewards of the tax dollar with that. Uh, and this just a uh, slide for you to share on Hastings. Uh, the average uh, value of a home, residential in Hastings, went up by over 7%. Um, after exclusions, you're seeing, uh, you're gonna see uh, the county portion go up about 2.9% or about $15 uh, for the average home on the county portion in Dakota County, or in the city of Hastings. And that is mostly, as I said, with a 7% uh, uh, increase in value. If your home actually did not go up in value according to the county, your county taxes will go down. So that's what I have there. And uh, lastly, it's always my pleasure to come here and present once a year and, and just give an update of what's happening at Dakota County. You certainly know how to get a hold of me throughout the year and uh, as do the residents, my contact information is up above and I'm available for any questions if anyone has any. Thank you, Commissioner, for your presentation. Once again, uh, appreciate uh, the valuable information you bring every year. Council, is there any questions or comments? Questions or comments? Councilmember Fultz? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, thank you very much, Mike. That was very informative. And that was actually the first that I had heard about the million dollars that was appropriated uh, for the homelessness yeah. uh, situation here in, in Dakota County. Yeah. And so I would just welcome to learn more about that and how the city might help um, sure. trying to learn more about providing um, affordable housing opportunities mm -hmm. and what the city can do and sure. if there's a, a role for the city to help with the homelessness as well. And I don't have the answers, but I would really love to learn more about that in the future. Well, thank you, Council Member. And if I may just quickly add, add to that, uh, it was in the news that Cochrane House, which is our men's homeless shelter for Dakota County, will be closing. Initially, it was going to be closing the end of December. Uh, and ultimately, uh, we were able to find some resources to keep that open until the end of May. And one of the things within that shelter study was realizing that having a shelter in Hastings that's literally about a 10, 15 walk just even to get into the heart of the community was uh, not a very, uh, was, was a, so many challenges with a lack of transit and transportation that um, the shelter was probably, the decision to ultimately close it uh, was something that I think was supported by others, but obviously not, not until we could figure out what was gonna be in its replacement on that. So I cer certainly appreciate that and any partnerships that can go on. Hastings has been a great partner in this with the Community Development Agency and our workforce housing, our senior housing. We've had a great relationship for many years on, on that and we hope to continue that and, uh, uh, as long as we can. And I think my last thing is if, if you're looking for kind of a volunteer site in there, uh, through Matrix Housing, which is who's running that temporary homeless shelter, they do actually have opportunities for preparing meals for the uh, individuals in the shelter as well as some needs that do come up. So there is a website on Matrix Housing that's addressing the Dakota County Temporary Winter Shelter that the residents or you may be interested in supporting. With that. Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much and Merry Christmas to you all. Thank you.
Okay, uh, Council, we have before us the uh, minutes of the regular City Council meeting of December 4th, 2017. Is there any additions or corrections to the minutes of that meeting? Seeing none, they stand approved. Uh, we have council items to be considered. Any council items to be considered? Seeing none, we'll go to the council, uh, excuse me, consent agenda. Council, what's your wish? Consent agenda. Councilmember Fultz makes a uh, moves to adopt the consent agenda, second by Councilmember Leifeld. That motion is now before the body. Is there any discussion to that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The motion prevails. Next, we'll go to uh, awarding of contracts and public hearing. Our first public hearing tonight is a second reading uh, to consider amendments to city ordinances, chapters, fees. And uh, Julie will present that. Thank Julie? you, Mayor. Yep, Council's requested to conduct a public hearing considered ordinance amendment adjusting various city fees. There are two changes to note from the first reading that was held two weeks ago. One is the construction inspection escrow was slated to go from $500 to $750. That's going to be eliminated. We actually collect that fee as part of our building permit fees. And also under the civic arena, the public skate freestyle is listed in the memo as going from $5 to $10, but it's actually going from $5 to $6. With that, I can stand for any questions. Yeah, what I'm going to do at this point is I'll open up the public hearing. Is there anyone here who would like to speak uh, in regards to uh, amendments to city ordinances, chapters 34, fees? Anyone here who would like to speak to that particular issue? Okay. Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Council, what's your wish? Councilmember Vaughn makes a motion to approve. Second by Councilmember Brox. That motion is before the body. Is there any further discussion to that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The motion prevails. Next, we have a public hearing on, regarding a rezone from R3 to uh, C1, McShane Development. John, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, City Council members. I'm just going to pull up some information on the request that we have before us tonight. Uh, there is an action to hold a public hearing related to an ordinance amendment for the rezoning of the property itself which is located on the corner of North Frontage Road and Pleasant Drive right here. It's about a 0.6 acre property, currently owned by the city. And as you're aware, we have a purchase and development agreement signed with McShane Development to sell the city owned property to them for development of a 3,500 square foot office uh, medical center for the property. Uh, prior to doing that, there are a couple of actions that need to take place. Uh, one of those is to have a uh, rezoning of the property and a comprehensive plan amendment. Looking at the property itself, when we uh, look at our comprehensive plan map, this little gray area indicates right of way. Uh, I, I, we never really indicated, we never really thought that this was a, a developable piece of property in the past, uh, had marketed it that way before, and so our future land use map uh, shows that as being right of way. So we're looking at amending the comprehensive plan to change this property designation from uh, right of way to commercial. And then consequently to amend the city code on a rezoning to rezone the property from R3 medium density residential to commercial itself. So as you look at this intersection, the pink areas here and the kind of reddish areas are areas that are presently zoned commercial on the property. So. We are in favor of both actions. We feel that they take uh, into consideration the, the best use of the property into the future and are consistent with the adjacent land uses on the property. Both of these items were reviewed by our planning commission on November 27th. Uh, they did hold a public hearing. We did not have any uh, testimony at the public hearing during that time and was a recommendation on both actions to approve them and to forward those to city council. So at this point, I can uh, answer any questions related to the actions or you may hold the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, John. I'm gonna open up the public hearing. The public hearing is open. Anyone here would like to uh, speak to the issue of rezoning that particular property from R3 to C1, McShane Development? Anyone here who's here to speak to that particular? Please come to the podium and give your name and address. Welcome to the meeting. How are you this evening? Jewel. Good. Good. My name is Jewel Pickard, and I just had a question, actually, is if you look at that particular piece of property, it doesn't look that big to be able to accommodate a building of that size, and I was kind of wondering if 
parking had been figured into that because it doesn't seem like there would be enough and if that would spill over into some of the other streets next to that. Okay, go ahead, uh, John, go ahead and answer the question. Mr. Mayor, I'd be happy to address that. Uh, yeah, it, it does look pretty tight on that property, it being 0.6 acres. We had the developer put together a concept plan for development which showed the 3,500 square foot building as well as about 20 or 30 parking spaces on there. So they meet our, our minimum parking requirements uh, with on the site along with the building footprint and the, the stormwater drainage. It's, it's a tight fit, but it'll, it'll fit on there. And from talking to the developer, from a, a practical standpoint, employee-wise, they, they need about 10 spaces a day for their employees, so they, they should be at more than adequate with the parking that they're providing. Okay. Did that answer your question? Okay, Joel. Okay. Okay, is there anyone else who'd like to speak to this particular issue? Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Council, let's go to that particular subject. It's under B1, under Community Development. We'll also take a look at B2 as well, uh, since it concerns itself with the uh, McShane development. Uh, Council, what's your wish? Councilmember Brox makes a motion to approve. Is there a second to that motion? Second by Councilmember Vaughn. Discussion to the motion. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The motion prevails. Then we have uh, amend the comprehensive plan, land use designation. Uh, Council, what's your wish? Councilmember Lund makes a motion to approve, second by Councilmember Leifeld. That motion is before the body. Discussion to that motion. Okay, seeing none, all those in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The motion prevails. Thank you. Next, we have a public hearing uh, relation to amend city code chapter 155, funeral homes and, cre and crematoria. John? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, city council members. We have before you in action tonight to hold a public hearing and to consider second reading of an ordinance amendment pertaining to funeral homes and crematory within the city of Hastings. What we're looking to do is to amend the, a couple of things within the city code. One is, with on your, is within your screen right now, which is to provide a definition of what is a funeral home. And within the definition of a funeral home, a funeral home would include crematoria uses. Crematoria uses would be something that could be conducted as part of a funeral home operation itself. The second would be is to include as a special use permit allowance of funeral homes within the R2 zoning district. Now the R2 zoning district is a residential district that essentially covers the, the older part of Hastings from downtown to Highway 55 uh, to, to Pine Street, uh, that older portion of Hastings. As you're probably aware, we have two existing funeral homes right now that operate within the R2 district and right now they're designated as lawfully existing non-conforming. Uh, essentially what that means is they're not really recognized within the zoning code, but they've existed there for such a time that uh, they're mostly grandfathered in. Uh, we have had one of the funeral homes that has approached us, Wise Funeral Homes, that has asked for some improvements to take place on site, in particular expansion of a parking area and also to perform crematory, crematory services on site itself. Within the existing zoning code, those uses would not be allowed. And so what we're asking for tonight is to consider an amendment to the zoning code to allow those via a special use permit. What that would mean is that a, a, a special use permit would be necessary prior to operation, review by the planning commission, review by the city council, and a, a public hearing uh, to consider what sort of uh, qualifications and what sort of uh, conditions may be placed before issuance of it. So just as a reminder tonight, what we're asking for is the amendment to the city code. Uh, we're not taking any action related to any of the wise uh, funeral home uh, requests tonight, but this would pave the way for that to occur in the future. So we did have this uh, reviewed before the planning commission on November 27th. They did vote 5-0 uh, to recommend approval of the action at that time. We did have some testimony from the public during the public hearing asking how the changes would affect uh, the Couturia Spit funeral property and future expansion of commercial uses itself. Uh, as a reminder on this one, we are looking, upon this amendment, we are looking to add funeral homes to the residential district. There would not be any further expansion of commercial uses beyond that one here. And uh, with this request as well, we had a planning committee meeting on October 30th 
where we asked the question of the committee to, to see if this was something that we should explore. Uh, they gave us the go ahead and we're coming forward with the amendment tonight. So I can answer any questions you have at this point or you can open the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you, John, appreciate that. I will open up the public hearing at this time. The public hearing is now open. Anyone here who would like to uh, speak in regards to the amendment to city code chapter 155, which uh, deals with funeral homes and crematoria. Anyone here who would like to speak to that particular issue? Amy? For the record, please, welcome to the meeting, first of all, and for the record, please state your name and address. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Amy Martin, and I live right across from the Kachuria Smith Funeral Home. Um, I did attend the meeting a few weeks ago, and my question, I guess, for John, probably, is if this amendment is changed, and in a few years from now, someone wants to expand the parking lot in our neighborhood, a historic neighborhood designated. Um, is, is changing this going to remove any possibility of that being turned down? I feel like this, uh, we have a, a neighborhood kind of at risk right now because the former Rosewood Inn is um, empty and bank owned as I understand it. I don't know, Justin might have more information on that, but um, I am, what I fear is that if the Rosewood Inn doesn't get purchased and fixed up and somebody just bought the funeral home and it is another funeral home company, that they are going to want to put in a huge parking lot and in a historic neighborhood. And the point was made at the meeting two weeks ago that when after when the transition to funeral homes started the funeral industry wanted to make people feel comfortable with you know turning over their loved ones remains to a stranger so they called um, them funeral homes and funeral parlors and they went into residential neighborhoods so that it felt more home-like and Kachuria has been a good neighbor um, but they fit in the neighborhood they were small they they don't have a huge parking lot. Um, there was another neighbor there two weeks ago. And when there's a funeral, our, our neighborhood is filled with cars. And that's okay. We all you know, drive slower and, and pick our way around. And it, it still works out because everyone's considerate of each other. They fit in the neighborhood. But an expansion that could include adding a parking lot, um, doesn't seem like fit for our neighborhood. We have actually already lost a beautiful, irreplaceable historic home in the 60s to a parking lot for the church. And so I guess my question is, does changing this remove any protection for the historic nature of our neighborhood? That's my fear. So. Go ahead, John, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Martin. I can address that. Uh, as far as the changes that are being contemplated tonight, uh, the would provide funeral homes and their ancillary expansions as a special use permit. So if a parking lot was to come forward, for example, for Couturia Smith, they would it require a special use permit. What that means is that certain conditions would need to be established and certain re review higher than what a permitted use outright uh, would need to take place in the property. Irregardless of that, there's if there's a historic structure uh, that would be in the path of a that would be potentially demolished uh, i think the protections the potential protections are still in place for that uh, the inaction of this ordinance amendment would have no effect on that and so i, I think the thing that would mostly protect against it would be uh, a historic designation of a home site uh, but with this ordinance itself the amendment that we're looking at that would any amendment or any expansion of the use would require that special use permit so they would be able to set conditions and either to have a a more intensive review than what we normally would have on something that would be permitted Did that answer your question okay thank you for your testimony and thank you john for answering that is there any further uh testimony tonight speaking to this issue then city code please sir come to the podium give us your name and address welcome to the meeting Glad to have you here. Uh, my name is Ralph Tapper. I live uh, next to the Weiss Funeral Home. 
And uh, could you explain to me what you mean when you say uh, cremation services? Or could, you, could you expand on that? Please, John. The, the question that was asked was uh, what the expansion of cremation services would entail on that. Uh, what the Wises would be asking to do upon uh, the ordinance amendment would be to, to perform cremations on site there. What they've talked about uh, is to build a separate building in which to do that, uh, probably located on the northern half of the property near 4th Street. So that that uh, procedure, uh, cremations, would be able to take place upon this amendment. Now, the ordinance amendment would allow that to take place. They would still need to get a permit in order to do that, but this would set the uh, table for that to be considered in the future. So that will be considered? Correct. Upon this amendment, it's something that could be considered. Right now, it could not. Right. It would It would be the end for the ordinance amendment, but specifically for the wises coming forward with any uh, approvals for cremation that would be a separate permit in the future okay. thank you sure thank you for your testimony okay, is there anyone else who would like to uh, speak for the council on this particular subject okay. seeing none i will close the public hearing uh council uh let's go to that subject uh what's your wish number three under community development that's what you wish. Councilmember Brox. I just have a question because a lot of um, the comments and the notes revolve around parking and I know that's not part of this amendment but I just want to ask a side question. So when we get a special use permit that comes forward for a funeral home in a residential neighborhood, what kind of parking is required in that scenario? Because I do see the, the parking, you know, the neighborhoods are filling up. It doesn't, it doesn't seem incredibly safe to me and I understand these two that we've been talking about have been there for a long time, um, but what are what are the requirements under the special use permit for parking? Is it typical that we just waive the need for parking if it doesn't exist, or what happens as a part of that process? Sure, and council member, with the two existing funeral homes being in operation prior to any parking requirements, they didn't have to fulfill any. In in the future, if uh, with Wise coming forward or any other parking expansions coming forward. We would take a look at having uh, one space per th uh, every three seats of the main uh, reception hall. Uh, that's what we've used as a standard before. And, and taking a look at, at WISE's operations and their proposal to provide parking on that, I, I think they would meet uh, that requirement on there. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, further discussion? I'll seek a motion. Member Leifeld. Council Member uh, Leifeld moves to uh, to approve. Is there a second to that motion? Second by Council Member Brox. Uh, that motion is before the body. Is there further discussion to the motion? Council Member Balsanic. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I, I, I don't want to put the cart before the horse here, but uh, when there is a crematorium that that uh, is placed. Uh, at a funeral home, uh, whether it's resi you know in a residential area or not, uh, what are the uh, what are the uh, uh, inspection uh, requirements and fulfillments that uh, that have to take place? I'm not sure if you can answer this, but we have our esteemed uh, building inspector in the back. Uh, Mr. Bach, and I, he might be able to talk to it, but perhaps okay. you can too. From my recollection from, uh, from earlier research on this, the Minnesota Department of Health has, per, has standards in which uh, crematories must adhere to. And I, I'm going to look at Mike for a second to see if he knows that there's a permit required through them as well. Yeah, it sounds there's a permit required through the Department of Health for the operation of cre crematories. And the reason I'm asking that is I did get uh, uh, some neighborhood response about that. You know, we're, it's a crematorium, it's going to be a furnace, there's going to be a chimney. Uh, you know, what kinds of requirements, what kinds of regulations, uh, who's going to be uh, inspecting uh, the premises to make sure that everything is, you know, the way it should be. And uh, th this is, 
you know, just to uh, make assurances to the public that we do have good backup systems uh, for inspections and so forth. Thank you, Your Honor. Sir. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, we have a motion before the body. Is there any further discussion to the motion? Okay. Seeing none, all those in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The motion prevails. Uh, next, we have a second reading of public hearing for amendments to the city ordinance regarding of right of way management. Nick, welcome to the meeting. Glad to have you here. Thank you, Mayor Hicks. Actually, I'm going to turn it over to our city attorney, Dan Flegel, for introductions. Okay. Well, well, our esteemed city attorney, then. Mr. Mayor and Council, uh, the Council tonight is asked to hold a public hearing and a second reading of a proposed ordinance amendment. It would be a comprehensive ordinance uh, regulating rights of way within the city. The existing ordinance in the city is fairly simple now, and the regulations were undertaken mostly at a staff level up to this point. Uh, this would, again, would be a, a comprehensive ordinance that would uh, regulate all uses of the right of way, but it's really being pushed by the wireless community who has uh, uh, obtained some legislation to really force cities to allow certain facilities within the rights of way that would not have otherwise been there. Uh, the ordinance talks about two main categories, small wireless facilities, and Nick will have a few pictures of those here, I think. Um, these are generally smaller devices that are going to be placed on existing poles or possibly replacement poles, smaller in size, and they are generally repeater units, I think, that uh, transmit from all of our smartphones to main units that will be a collector unit and transmit data over hard lines or fiber to a central location. The uh, right-of-way regulations will also regulate installations of uh, uh, wireless structures, generally f uh, poles that will be placed within the right-of-way, either existing poles again or new poles that could be installed. There are height restrictions and location restrictions on those as well. So again, what you're looking at here, I think, is more of one of the small wireless facilities. Nick can correct me if I'm wrong there, uh, but it is correct. placed on a support structure. Um, these are generally going to come in from applications from wireless providers. Sometimes they'll be coming in in multiple requests. That is allowed under the new law. Uh, cities have limited ability to prohibit these, so we have had to make some accommodations based on the legislation to allow these. Uh, what you're being asked to do tonight, in addition to the public hearing and the second reading on the main ordinance, is also to approve a co-location agreement that would be used as a template whenever the city is asked to have some of these small wireless facilities placed upon their existing poles. That allows some rent to be collected by the city, although it's a fairly small amount, and that's also regulated by the statute. And finally, we have uh, this is a very long ordinance, so we've included a summary publication resolution that would allow for publication of just excerpts from the ordinance instead of the whole thing as a cost-saving device. That requires five votes. The other votes would just be a majority of the, of the council. So I can stand for any questions. Nick can certainly run through any of the pictures if that may be helpful. But uh, generally, we're asking that there be a public hearing and a second reading of the ordinance followed by the two other actions. Thank you, Councilor. Appreciate that. I'm going to open up the public hearing at this time. The uh, hearing is open. Is there anyone here who wishes to speak to the issue relating to uh, uh, right-of-way management? Anyone here would like to speak to that particular issue? It's a little mind-boggling. Uh, okay. Seeing none, I will uh, close the uh, public hearing. Council, that's number uh, one under public works. Uh, let's go to that discussion. Uh, Council Member Michael. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> I do have a clarifying question in reading through this. So. When the small wireless facility, the deployment of small wireless facilities in any public right away meant companies could come in, they could use our poles, we couldn't stop them, we couldn't charge them. Is that accurate? That's fairly okay. accurate, uh, subject to some regulation. The, ci the city still has the ability to regulate for public safety, health and safety issues, but that's what the legislature was trying to limit us to, not a straight prohibition and, and really no, uh, they, they limited the amount of rent that we could charge. Okay, so this particular ordinance then would, in essence, they'd have to go through the city in order to use a pole or put a pole in one of our public right-of-ways within the city limits. That's correct. Uh, as far as using existing poles, uh, 
the addition of new poles would, would be different in residential districts as opposed to commercial or other districts. Uh, the cities are allowed to require special use or conditional use permits with the process that was discussed by John earlier for an application uh, in residential districts. So that would give the council a little more control on the placement of poles in uh, residential areas. Uh, they're effectively permitted uses, though, in commercial and other districts, so there won't be a lot of regulation allowed on those. That's Member Brox. I'm just curious if we've received any requests to locate any small cell wireless to date. Uh, not with specifics, Council Member. There has been one entity that's been asking us about where our process is at. Uh, I think they're anxious to see that come to fruition so they can start the wheels turning on an application. Uh, however, that particular entity is, uh, when they came forward originally, they were interested in furnishing a, a pole structure, a large pole structure. Uh, not so much the small devices like you see in the photo here. It could evolve into something like that. We're not sure if they've retooled in the time in between, but uh, we're expecting it to, to take off at some point here in early 2018. In the uh, 20, uh, oh, I'm sorry, were you, did you have more questions, Council Member? I didn't mean to cut you off. Okay, I apologize. Uh, you know, this was a much uh, debated uh, subject at the Capitol in 20. 17 legislative session. Uh, of course, there was big money behind the uh, media companies, uh, wireless companies and cell companies to do this. Ironically, you know, we're all excited about the Super Bowl coming to Minneapolis. That's really what sped this up. That's really why I was at the legislature because uh, they wanted to be able, these companies covering the Super Bowl uh, wanted to be able to have this opportunity to fill these up in Minneapolis because of the increased data it's going to be easier with all the visitors and everything else uh, and the size of the event. So as part of that process, uh, we have the folks at the Capitol said, let's, you know, let's move this to be statewide so we can do this in St. Paul and other cities. And they, were, they came in and said, we shouldn't have to pay a dime. So uh, even though we, we're getting a small fee, uh, the league, our friends at the League of Minnesota City and our friends at Metro Cities lobbied hard to get some of these impacts uh, minimized a little bit so we can collect some fees as Dan alluded to, not much, but at least we get something. And uh, we have some regulation, even though it's limited. So uh, this, was, uh, this was quite a battle at the Capitol. This is kind of what they came up with as somewhat of a compromise. And uh, that's where we are today. Councilmember Fulch. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, thank you for that quick in, you know, introduction or review over what's occurred. And I am concerned about what uh, possibly the financial impact will be. It might not be within the first 12 months, but you know, in the next five years, you know, when you go to conferences that are related to um, you know, what, what's coming you know, in the future via technology and uh, video streaming and security services and things like that, you know, they talk about how the infrastructure is going to just boom. And so um, I think it would be interesting if, if staff could somehow um, financially track these requests and um, what the actual financial impact was to the city and then you know what was actually we were able to recoup because it's my understanding that they can come in and request that you know that these devices be placed i'm just gonna make something up you know down vermilion street on lights like i don't know every 10 poles whatever and that the city wouldn't have the ability then to charge back to the um the requester the any fees associated with any kind of engineering um, analysis that might have to be done you know to be able to ascertain whether or not the structures are um, able to actually hold you know those devices um, and so I just think it would be um, terrific if we had some kind of evidence to show what the impact is uh, to our community you know at, at the expense of taxpayers so that big business can actually um, save a couple bucks Maybe we can go back to the legislature someday with some right data exactly under our arm and yeah that's what I'm getting at tell the cost councilmember Brox uh, excuse me, Dan. Did you I, want to I just want to note that you know the staff. We have talked about the need for uh, following this and tracking it and, and tracking the costs. There is the ability to recapture it, uh, 
management fees and fees associated with things like structural engineering uh, evaluations for poles and things like that. So that is included in here. It's going to be difficult to capture all that or know what it is in advance, so some history is going to help us know better from year to year. And I think there is an intent of staff to track that and then try to narrow down the actual management costs to the application fees and, and get it right. Uh, Councilmember Brox. I did also want to note for everyone that is listening that Councilmember Fulch, Councilmember Balsonic, and I, and um, Melanie Mescali were all at the Capitol, I believe in October, September, um, when this, this, when was this being discussed? Was it last year, last spring? Um, and we actually met with our representative and senator at the time, and I, I don't know what they did individually, but we did have meetings with them to talk to them about how this would affect the city and that we were concerned about it and advocated on the city's behalf. So even though it maybe didn't go the way that we hoped it would, we did um, advocate on behalf of the city and our, what was in our best interests. And I think I at least wrote several emails and letters and made phone calls. And I believe um, council members Fulch and Balsonic did the same. So I did want to point out that we were in this instance, we were advocating on behalf of the city of Hastings, even though it didn't really go the way that we wanted it to. Um, but I thought they deserved some recognition for that. Councilmember Lund. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm just, just curious about um, aesthetics and control over that. You know, what, <clears throat> what, what, uh, what type of, what type of, type of uh, recourse do you have if there's something like that on a really nice light pole that we're putting down by Vermillion, you know? Uh, two things there. The size of these structures is limited to a certain uh, cubic foot, and so each of them have to be, on the pole, have to be a, can only be a certain maximum uh, volume, and then also anything on the ground also has a limitation there. But there's also provisions for uh, application on decorative poles, uh, things like that, and we can Im uh, impose restrictions uh, on those to try to force these things to fit in better with the poles. I don't think they're ever going to be perfect, and there may or may be a detraction from decorative poles, but at least we have some ability to regulate those and require the providers to try to shield them, try to make them consistent with the decorative poles as they come in. Councilmember Balsanic. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, in my communication with uh, the uh, legislature, um, my standard phrase was, uh, the fox is in the hen house. Um, it, it, the whole thing, I, I, I don't want to say it frightens me, but it does frighten me. Um, th th this is something that uh, I, I think it's kind of being shoved down our throats. Now, granted, uh, you know, the bill that finally passed was one that uh, uh, was a model ordinance, or, or I should say a model ordinance was put together by the League of uh, Minnesota Cities, of which we're a member. Um, you know, and of course our staff uh, uh, did uh, work quite diligently on uh, putting this all together. I just, uh, and, and, and again, thank you to the staff and thank you uh, uh, to Dan uh, for all of the work that you've done on this. Uh, I, I just, it, it's, it's like a bucking bronco, it's like a fox in the hen house, uh, all, of my, all of my agricultural <laughs> uh, uh, euphemisms here. It, it, I, I just see this as something that's going to be hard to keep track of. Uh, you know, what's the size? What's the size of the unit they want to put in? Uh, uh, where do they want to put this pole and that pole? And uh, if, if I, I just don't know how much of this is coming in, I don't think anybody really does, uh, except to say there's probably going to be a lot of it coming in, an awful lot of it. Uh, in the future, and uh, you know, we are collecting, as you said, some minimum fees. I'm not sure what kind of a burden this is putting on uh, our city employees, our staff, in terms of keeping track of these. 
because my assumption, you know, having read through this, is that every time they want to put something like this up, this is not coming before the city council, right? No. This is, it has to this be approved, is, though, by the... But, I mean, it, it, yeah, it's going, to yeah. Be, it's going to be staff approved. Uh, it, it just, you know, with all due respect to the staff, if I start walking down 2nd Street one day and I look and I go, what in the heck is that doing there? Uh, and, and then we've got to bring it before the council and then, you know, kind of start working backwards on the whole thing. I'm just, I'm just not comfortable uh, with, with the whole situation. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, and I, I, why am I saying this? Because it was stated the staff is going to keep very close track of this. We're going to watch it like a hawk. And that's what we need to do. Uh, and, and perhaps uh, let's give us a report in a year or less, six months maybe even, uh, so we can see exactly where this is going. Um, and, and then we can uh, run back to the legislature and uh, you know, make some more requests or some more euphemisms, I suppose. Okay. I'll, I'll try to think of some more. Uh, uh, in the meantime, but you know, just just to caution the public, uh, you know, we we just went through this whole thing with the FCC about uh, you know internet neutrality, and that's been taken away from us. And now, uh, you know, we've got companies that can can come in and strap on a piece of equipment that um, you know can be on on a historically accurate uh, replication of a, of a light standard uh, or in a commercial district they say this is where we want the, the pole to be and they go ahead and put it in and what does that do to the aesthetics of our uh, historic community uh, something that I'm, I'm very very concerned about very concerned about. Right. Well, um, thank, thank you, Dan, Your Honor. Thank you, uh, Councilmember. As Dan had indicated, if it was put on some kind of a historic pole or significance, uh, we would have some governing ability over that. We could deny that. But your point's well taken that we'll uh, continue. I'm sure, you know, our uh, qualified staff has already got a plan out there about notifying us what these things are going to look like. So I'm not, go I'm not going to be worried about being surprised. But uh, your point about uh, keeping track uh, is duly noted. Councilmember Fultz? Um, thank you, Your Honor. What I was going to say is uh, several months ago now, geez, I'm, I'm losing track of the seasons, <laughs> but when the League of Minnesota Cities had uh, conducted a, a webinar that was available yeah. on, on these um, small cell towers, and they had released uh, documentation to go with it, and I read through that, and I participated in the webinar, and not only was there provision for decorative uh, light poles, that you had control over that, I thought it was also within historic districts. And I haven't had the opportunity to revisit this like in the last, you know, over the weekend to, to double check that. Um, but I, I'm i sorry, it was a thick packet this time mm -hmm. around and I didn't get a chance to, um, I had more time to have researched it, but um, I didn't, when I just perused what you've provided, I didn't see um, any mention of the decorative pole um, ability um, to restrict, and then I didn't see anything about the historic district either. But like I said, it was a quick, whoo, you know, skimming over, and so I would just ask that that get double checked um, to help preserve um, not only the downtown area, but it might also help within the historic neighborhoods. Right? Okay. Anything's yeah. better than nothing at this point. So. <laughs> I, I was able to read a summary of it uh, that the League of Minnesota Cities put out on it too, that indicated these protections. Right. Dan, okay, did you want to add on anything to this? Uh, I don't know how helpful it'll be, but subdivision three of section, you know, this is a voluminous thing, uh, 1.11 does say where an applicant proposes co-location on a decorative wireless support structure, which I think is what you're primarily talking out there, um, sign or other structure not intended to support those facilities. City may impose reasonable requirements to accommodate the particular design, appearance, or intended purpose of the structure. So I think that will help on decorative poles. The other comment I would have is the triggering f for new support structures, which would be new poles, that is in the uh, zoning code changes, which I believe would require a special use permit, not only in uh, rural, or excuse me, residential districts, but also 
as well as national register historic district. So if there is a truly historic district, the council, it would come back to the council for some regulation there, might not be able to deny, but you would be able to impose some uh, regulation on it there. So that's in the, the back of the ordinance in the chapter 155.10 uh, ordinance changes for the zoning code. Okay, council, can we get a motion to put this on the floor? I guess we can move we on. Do we have, we have a motion. Okay, Council Member Ball makes a motion to approve, second by Council Member Brox. That motion is before the body. Uh, is there further uh, discussion to the motion? Further discussion on this item? Seeing none, all those in favor of the item, uh, this motion, excuse me, say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The motion prevails. Then we have a second one before, a uh, resolution for authorizing publication of the summary of the ordinance amendment. Uh, five votes is required uh, to do this. And this is so we can basically summarize it. We have to print it in full uh, in our publications, in our legal publications. Council Member uh, Vaughn makes that motion approved, second by Council Member Fultz. That motion is before the body. Any further discussion to that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of that motion say aye. Aye, those opposed, nay, the motion prevails. Uh, there's also a third action on the co-location agreement, which is effectively the lease. The third action is a co-location agreement. Dan, can you uh, explain that one? Sure. It's basically a lease between the city and these providers that uh, would govern the terms by which they can put these facilities on poles owned by the city. Okay. Okay. To that subject matter, is there a motion? Councilmember Fultz makes that motion to approve. Second by Councilmember Leifeld. Councilmember Lund, did you have a question? Please. Sure, it's effectively a lease between the city and the wireless provider that would govern the terms by which they can place their facilities on city-owned poles. So city-owned light poles, things like that, would not apply to things like Excel Energy poles, which are also common throughout the city. This is what allows the city to collect rent. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, that motion is before the body. Any further discussion to that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of that motion say aye. Aye, those opposed nay, the motion prevails. Okay, next is number five on the contracts of public hearing, uh, well number seven rehabilitation project. Nick, thank you. Thanks, Mayor Hicks. Uh, tonight for the council's consideration, we have a resolution to award a contract on our well number seven maintenance project. This is something that we do with each of our wells on about a 10 year cycle, it requires extracting all the mechanical parts out of the well tube that goes down some several hundred feet into the ground to pump water up and into our system. Uh, these are the parts that are out of sight, out of mind, and unless we pull them out of there and take a close look at that along with all the other mechanical uh, components of the well every so often, uh, we don't truly know how it's wearing and tearing. So routine program, um, we got four bids last Tuesday for this work, and the lowest of those being from Trout Companies, uh, about $99,000. I will note that the type of contract that we have with well maintenance is essentially an a la carte sort of arrangement where they give us prices for any of the possible sorts of activities they would do. That doesn't mean we will do 100% of those activities. Typically, we are not uh, getting even close to that. Uh, for example, we've, we've done three of these maintenance projects in the last uh, five years, and uh, we'll get in the range of sixty to seventy thousand dollars of expenses for this sort of project, and that's what we expect in this case as well. Uh, so uh, again, the uh, recommendation from staff is to award the contract to trout companies in the amount of ninety nine thousand four hundred dollars. We'd start work on this uh, either at the very tail end of 2017 here or very beginning of 2018 and then it'll last a couple of months and we'll have the well back ready for service in the spring okay. turn it back to you mayor hicks all right thank you uh, nick for that presentation council this item is before us what's your wish council member uh, Leifel makes a motion to approve is there a second to that motion second by council member vaughn that motion is now before the body is there further discussion to the motion Seeing none, all those in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The motion prevails. We'll go to community development, items four and five. Thank uh, you, Mr. Mayor. John? 
I'm just going to call up a brief presentation here while uh, you're with me for just a moment. Looking at a subject tonight, I know that the council is all very familiar with, and that is the redevelopment of the Hudson facility and the transformation to Great River Landing. And uh, I'll go through some updates that uh, we've had today and uh, the discussion that we're looking to have tonight on the property itself. Now, within your packet, uh, originally as it was presented, we had within there a resolution for uh, amendment of the purchase and development agreement. As you know, we have an existing purchase and development agreement with confluence development for the property itself. We've been actively working to prepare amendments to that application so that we can transfer the property. It's been a desire from uh, the council and from city staff to be able to transfer the property and begin development as soon as we can on this. Uh, as you may recall, uh, earlier this afternoon, we did submit to you the, the version of the first amendment of the purchase and development agreement. And given the timing of the amendment details, the council tonight may opt to delay action until January 2nd, 2018. We did want to preserve the ability tonight to be able to present some of the findings that we have, the changes within the purchase and development agreement, and also to run through the project itself. This has been something that has been going on for, for quite a long time here and uh, wanted to provide some context and also some of the changes that are being proposed as we move forward. First thing I have before you is where we're located at, which I think most people know, which is the uh, Hudson Development, which is a four acre site, 100,000 square foot building on the Mississippi River downtown. We've been the proud owners of this building for about seven years now, and this is what it looked like in the past. We've done, we've done extensive work on the property over the last couple of years. You may recall, this is what the property looked like to begin with. It was over 200,000 square feet. The new bridge goes right through here. 20,000 square foot piece was taken off here. 48,000 square foot piece taking off here. As you take a look at what the river trail used to look like, this is what the river trail looked like going into the facility and towards the old bridge. You could see that the building itself came right up to it. One of the objectives that we've had collectively over the years is to remove the industrial development along the river in downtown Hastings and to redevelop it into green space and active areas. We've been very successful for what we've done over the years, particularly in the eastern part of the downtown area, where you may recall that we had rendering plants and oil tanks in those areas, and, and uh, the tanks that we had just up towards Lock and Dam Road, that those are all gone right now. This itself is the last piece along the Mississippi River. So what have we been planning over the years? The Heart of Hastings plan we did 15 years ago had a lot of value into looking at what we wanted to do with the, with the site. The interesting part of this plan, which is now 15, 16 years old, is how much it resembles what is being brought forward today. Uh, we have the preservation of the historic Hudson Building, we have public open space, we have a promenade area, and we have some uh, potential here for future development to the west of the building. Those items are being preserved as we move forward with this plan tonight. A little bit of the project history. We've, as we said, we've gone through this project now for about seven years uh, as we've, uh, we've looked at the, the changes on it. This is an interesting picture up here. This is the demolition of the 1974 edition, that tip-up building near the river. You can see the two bridges there. To provide some context of, of how we've been working on this project here. When we were first faced with this project, what we wanted to do was to create something that would be an attraction as people moved across the new bridge into downtown Hastings, something that would be an opportunity, a destination point for people to stop. And that was a, a key objective towards uh, redevelopment of this. One of the things that we were uncertain of as we first entered into this project was whether we were going to keep the building or whether we were going to demolish the building and have a development site. One of the things that we did early on is we went through a reuse study of the property. And with the public's help, we, were, we determined that what we wanted to see on that property was a rehabilitation of the historic aspect of that building and a mixed use development, something that would be commercial, something that would have some residential. The term banquet facility came up many, many times and is still a part of the development as we move forward. So with that, 
We did a lot of environmental investigation, a lot of environmental cleanup. We demolished portions of the building. We took out old soils. We took out asbestos and, and other contaminants within the building itself. And uh, we're very fortunate with that that we've received uh, a lot of grant funds to assist with the redevelopment of the property as well as the environmental rehabilitation of it. With Confluence Development, what we did is we entered into an original preliminary agreement with them in 2014. You may recall uh, 2013, 2014, we looked at a bunch of different scenarios from different developers as to how best to develop the property. What, we've, what we came across with Confluence Development was the confidence that they could do a quality job on the project uh, from their experience in dealing locally with, with Pat Regan and the experience with Schoolhouse Square and, and Bill Whalen and his experience in rehabilitation of historic structures in downtown and riverfront development, primarily in Louisville, Kentucky. So we entered into a preliminary purchase agreement with them in 2014. We uh, continued to work with them in 2016. We had a purchase and development agreement. What well, that was, the purchase and development agreement set the table for transfer of the property. And uh, there were certain key measures in there, approval of plans, historic preservation approval, environmental contamination remediation were things that we needed to work towards in order to transfer the property. As we continued to work through those, we came through some complexities. Some of the things that came up were, were more complex, took more time than we anticipated to occur. Primarily on the environmental end of it, the, uh, the, the crawl space areas within the building itself, dealing with some of those contaminations uh, underneath the floorboards themselves was a lot more time, time consuming than necessary. We were fortunate to receive an EPA grant of $600,000, but with that there came some strings attached that we needed to do some more cultural investigations and other research prior to the execution of those grant funding. Uh, so some of those items just took longer than we anticipated to do on the property itself. And so we had blown past the dates, frankly, of some of the original uh, dates of the purchase and development agreement. So we've been working diligently with the development team to be able to provide an amendment to that agreement itself. And that's what I have before you tonight within the, uh, the larger, thicker packet as well as uh, the, the summary, which I'll go through. You may recall that in the summer of this year, we went down, we met on site with Confluence Development to share some of their concept plans, and we also had a uh, special workshop that we held in November to talk about the, the plan development itself. The plan continues to move forward as seen here with the rehabilitation of the Hudson Building into 67 hotel rooms, 22 apartment units, 20,000 square foot of uh, retail uh, or commercial banquet facility space within the property. Rehabilitation of the riverfront is shown here, some surface parking, and then the construction of a parking garage of 119 stalls, which is the site of the existing First National Bank building. This kind of gives some views here of, of what the project would look like upon execution. And the parking garage itself. So, what are we looking at here? What are, what are the changes that we are contemplating tonight with this first amendment to the purchase and development agreement? I've laid out some of the, the key aspects for you within the memo itself, and I'll go through those in detail here during the presentation. One of these is the dates, the completion dates, the commencement dates. What we have within the purchase and development agreement amended is that we would close the property by January 22nd, 2018. So about one month from today, we would close on the property. Confluence would submit building plans for the property by August 1st of 2018. Now I'll point that out that August 1st date was a little bit later than we had originally comprehended. From talking to Confluence, that date recognizes their need to obtain historic tax credit part two approval prior to finalizing their construction documents for the building permit. So they're requesting additional time to put their historic tax credit information into place and then to submit for their building permit. So building permit for the site would be August 1st. Start of construction would be 30 days after issuance of that permit, and the substantial completion date right now would be December 15th, 2019. So a couple of changes from what we had previously discussed. Number one, that later date for submittal of plans for building permit, and two, the substantial completion date uh, being later than what was originally comprehended on that. Um, so Confluence has 
has said that they will work as best as they can to provide for a, a great deal of completion by the end of 2018 on that. When you take a look at the, uh, the de submittal date for the building permit, if they were to go to August 1st in, in the limited time period they have in the fall, it's, it's unclear as to how much construction could take place within 2018 there, given those dates. Um, one of the key aspect there too is that with the completed improvements, the assessed valuation prior to January 1st of 2019 would likely be less than what we originally anticipated. The key aspect of that is our bond payment of about $228,000 that we anticipated making one more time, we may end up making a substantial portion of that again. So that is a key point that I wanted to bring forward tonight that the, the construction timeframe being extended uh, may have repercussions on uh, the bond payment because of the, the amount of the building that would be improved itself. Under environmental obligations itself, uh, we had discussed this in our, in our joint meeting a couple weeks ago we have really two items of environmental remediation that we would be responsible for after closing of the property. One would be the installation, excuse me, of this vapor intrusion mitigation system. This is that active system that vents out the soil vapor uh, through HVAC systems. What we had discussed at, the, uh, at our workshop was the cost of that system and also providing some other portions of that requested by the developer, in particular the, uh, the removal of floor joists and the creation of a new floor and the additional uh, funds to do that. So what this environmental obligation comprehends, the 792,000, contemplates the full installation of that vapor system, the modifications that were recently uh, needed for it, as well as that additional work for the floor joist removal and the, uh, the new floor for the facility. Uh, the second item there would be some sealing of contaminated wood joists and ceiling. There's some PCB contaminants embedded within the wood portion and portions of the building itself. We've gone through and done some sampling. This would uh, provide funding in order to remediate that upon construction of the building itself. Uh, under pre-closing obligations, a lot of the pre-closing obligations that were in the origi original agreement have been eliminated. Uh, prior to, uh, to transfer of the property. One would be the SHPO approval for uh, historic tax credits, approval of construction plans, and full, re full remediation of environmental contaminants. So Confluence has, uh, has ceded that they will, not, they will not be seeking those items as part of the pre part of transfer of the bill, that those would be completed after transfer was to occur on that one. So. One of the things I did want to point out with the contingencies being waived there, the result is with this later construction date, uh, the developer could exercise the contingency later on and effectively cancel the deal after closing but before initiation of construction. What you have here is you've a couple of target dates. You have the, uh, the transfer of the property, that January date, and then you also have the submittal of plans for a building permit. So. Uh, say, for example, the city was to close on the property by, by the 22nd, property is transferred, Confluence continues their due diligence, they come up to August, prior to August 1st, something was to happen where uh, the project, they chose not to move forward with the project. They could exercise that contingency at that time and we could get the property back. So I just wanted to make the council aware that with the extension of that uh, time period, that is uh, a risk that uh, is involved within the property itself. Uh, I've also have some more information here, mortgages and liens on the properties itself. Uh, one of the things that with this extended time period, we wanna make sure that any construction or any improvements that was to occur uh, during that period between now, between closing of the property and potential uh, building permit, uh, that there we would not encounter, encumber any sort of uh, construction that could be a lean situation if the property was to come back to us. One of the things we also had authorization of is the parking ramp structure grant. I remember we had discussed earlier this year that the parking ramp grant we received from Metropolitan Council of about $1.5 million. Originally it was planned for the Hudson property itself. 
wanted to be transferred to the First National Bank property. We, uh, we have received the documents from Metropolitan Council to provide for that transfer, and the uh, amendment itself contemplates that. So that are, those are some of the major items for the, for the First Amendment to the Purchase and Development Agreement. Now that development agreement document has a number of subsections to it. Uh, I'm gonna highlight a couple of those as we move forward here. One of those is uh, an amendment to the public use agreement. The public use agreement is that agreement for the use of public land, the park land along the riverfront itself. There will be a revision there uh, to incorporate the revised site plan as well as a legal description. Uh, you may recall a couple of weeks ago we, we uh, took action to, uh, on the final plat to recognize some changes within the legal description on that property. And another key aspect of this would be the parking use and maintenance agreement. You may recall that back on November 20th, we did have some discussion on the parking ramp, the 119 space ramp across the street, what obligations the city would have, what obligations the developer would have. And as we go through that here, uh, the what the, what the per parking use and maintenance agreement shows is that it would be privately owned with a public easement for parking within the entire private structure. Developer would undertake the structural maintenance of the structure, and then within the structure, there'd be a subdivision really between the lower portion along 2nd Street, the 36 stalls, and the upper portion uh, on the second floor, which is 83 stalls. On the 83 stalls of the upper level, the city would provide for routine maintenance costs of that, which are termed to be 70% of the, the total maintenance costs. Our best estimate on that, based on $100 a stall, would be about $8,300 annually for that aspect of it. The bottom, and there would not be any prohibition or closures within that top portion of the ramp itself. That's another key aspect that was discussed in part of this agreement. On the lower portion, that 36 units or 36 parking spaces that would be adjacent to Second Street, Confluence would, uh, would retain responsibilities for routine maintenance of those spaces as well as the, um, the ability for uh, potential closures that could be up to 30 days a year, five days a month. Again, that would be restricted to the bottom level. The upper portion of 83 spots would not be affected by that. So that's kind of the highlights of some of the agreements as we're moving forward here. So really what happens from here is upon transfer of the building, we would also have some other approvals that would need to go forward to the council and, and various commissions relating to the parking structure, getting the site plan approval on that, on the Hudson Building landscape and grading approval, and then construction plans on the Hudson Building itself. I also wanted to provide to you just a, a snapshot of the financial analysis, financial capacity, really where we're at on the project itself. We anticipate that this environmental remediation of the site is gonna cost about $2.7 million when finished. And to date, this provides an update of what we have uh, for funding of it. We've had about 830,000 grant, grants awarded to date, Hedra payments of about 600, we have some grants in progress as well. We also have about $400,000 in additional monies there. And these would be monies that would be paid out uh, from city funds, or Hedra funds, excuse me. Right now, the Hedra cash balance is about $1.1 million, with much of, of the $600,000 being covered in prior years already to 2017. So this, these payments here are, are not necessarily a reflection of the of 2017 numbers, but a compilation of, of funds uh, that have been spent by Hedger over the years on the project. Uh, we anticipate right now, if we're successful in grant funding, that we would fund an additional $391,000 on this project. If that was to occur, if we were to get the grants that we are applying for, uh, could, we would conservatively project the cash balance for Hedger to be around $600,000 for this project. Right now, we have three grant opportunities. Two of them we've applied for. One of them we've heard back that uh, they have denied. One of them we're in process, and one we plan to apply for in January. And so we'll, we'll continue to, uh, to move forward with those applications. And um, I think that would do it for my, my presentation and my summary tonight. I know I have put a lot of information forward to you. 
and a lot of it late in the day here, so I'm, I'm certainly available for any questions that you may have here. And uh, Pat Regan of Confluence Development is also here as well if you have any specific questions for him. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, that was a uh, you know, much needed detail, so uh, I appreciate you going through that, John. Appreciate that summary. It's a very complex project. Uh, Council, you'll see on our agenda tonight uh, a four and five requiring action. Uh, and uh, I was discussing this with staff earlier that uh, I think we'd be best served if we'd not vote on that tonight because well, there's a lot of information that we just got. Uh, a lot of this, uh, as John indicated, were kind of wrapped up uh, earlier this afternoon. Uh, so I think it's, it's fair that the, the council and the public in general get a chance to absorb this information that's before us and have this uh, before us in our first council meeting in January, which I believe is January 2nd. Correct. Okay? So uh, we won't be voting on this tonight. Uh, we'll put, uh, we'll, but tonight we have uh, Pat here. Uh, we have an opportunity to, to, uh, to respond, uh, even though I know much of this information is new. And so council, I'm going to open up for discussion. Council, any uh, points? Council Member Brox. John, I just have a question about what's the worst case scenario? So what if none of the grants get funded of the three that we applied for? What is the amount that is going to come out of Hedra and what will the remaining balance be? Sure. The grant total that we'd be applying for would be about $500,000 here. So when we, uh, if we were to add that $500,000 to uh, the, the cash balance itself, uh, we would probably be in a the couple hundred thousand dollar range for cash balance in Hedra. Member Lund. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, can you explain to us why the Met Council denied our our grant request? Sure. On that one, an we just learned of that on Friday, and I haven't had an opportunity to get a lot of detail from them. I, I know that they had a minimum threshold for scoring that they've used, and we did not meet that. But I will question them as to anything specific to that. Uh, I'd like to ask a question to Pat. Pat, can I speak to you for a second? Thank you, uh, Mr. Reagan, for being here tonight. We appreciate it and uh, the Thank project you. that you're bringing forward. I, I think we all share the excitement to, to see the fruition of this project. But I wanted to ask you, you know, uh, one of the proposals tonight is that, uh, you know, first of all, I'm very glad to see we have a closing date uh, identified, January 22nd. That, we haven't had that before, so I'm very glad to see that. But uh, as part of this, uh, we see a submittal of plans for building permit by August 1st. Uh, I understand because of the earlier agreements that we had, purchase agreement, that the site approvals were going to take place before uh, any closing date. We waived that, and I think we're all in agreement that we should do that as we move forward. But uh, one of the, some of the language that I'm concerned about is the, you know, uh, reverting the, the, the building back to the city. And I just want to get from you what the commitment is from Confluence about moving forward on this project because th those are kind of li kind of language that I get concerned about. Mm -hmm. So Pat, if you can talk, you know, address that the best you can. Um, we are fully committed. We have done a lot of work uh, on our plans. When we were asked most recently for this amendment to commit to a uh, date for the uh, the plan submittal, uh, we had to take into consideration that in Minnesota, the SHPO requires fully developed construction plans. That actually was a, a surprise. We did learn this a year or two ago now, but to the Kentucky partners that I have uh, in Kentucky, you can submit a concept plan much like we've already submitted to the city and like we tried to submit to the Minnesota SHPO and they reject those plans asking for a fully developed set of construction plans, basically the same level of plans we will be submitting to the city for our building permit. We can, we can complete those plans by April or May of 2018, but we can't say what the SHPO will tell us about those plans. They've already given us some negative reaction on the, the concept plans we submitted to them 
early on in this process. So if, if we only had to go through the city, we'd be confident in, in telling the city that we could have the plans to you. And maybe we can, sub, can submit them concurrently to both the city and the SHPO, but it's going to be contingent on the, ship, the SHPO's, uh, they'll give us a conditional approval. That's what we're looking for from them. And that they have a certain number of days, I think it's, is it 60 days, by which they must, uh, by law, respond to our submittal. And uh, so that's the reason for the, us asking for the, uh, the planned submittal contingency date to be as late as August. We don't, uh, we hope that's not the date, but again, that's up to the SHPO. Our commitment to the project is still 100%. Uh, if, if the SHPO doesn't approve this project, we'll be back here with a plan that doesn't involve the SHPO. I can tell you that. What that will look like, I, I can't tell you because we haven't spent any time studying that, but I know some things that cost us extra money, like rehabbing windows instead of putting new windows in. There might be some different treatment to the exterior of the building rather than having to clean up and replace every nook and cranny and of, of every brick on the whole building. I don't know that we would go to that extent to, to rehab the outside of the building. We would have insulation in the building like we want, but they won't let us have. So I can tell you that we're committed to finishing this project, we have not. Uh, we've act, we're, we're more excited because of the, the, uh, what we've learned and who we've brought on board to, to operate a hotel. We've got a good hotel operating partner with a, a letter of intent. They just spent uh, all last week down in Louisville going through all of the, the Wayland partners in the city, uh, the city people down in, in all their projects in Louisville and they're, they're back, they're walking on air, so excited about what we can do with this project. Uh, I'd also say that if we can, uh, what we're asking, what you're contemplating here tonight and gonna contemplate in early January now, that in my mind that actually speeds the process up. We are accepting some contingencies that we're, that we were waiving some contingencies that are in the existing plan. We think we get a better handle on controlling the schedule on the completion of the, what's really held this up, and that's the environmental, the work, especially under the crawl spaces. If, if, the, if this uh, um, amendment goes through as it's proposed, and we've had a lot of hard work done by Mr. Flegel and our legal counsel and the city staff on the details on that, I think this will speed up the completion of the, what's the environmental problems that are holding us up. We're gonna take a lot of responsibility for taking over that schedule in this scenario, which we're happy about. And I also think that uh, we, if we get approval to spend the Met Council funds on the, on the parking ramp, and I met, the last thing we did before we came down tonight was meet with Greg Stotko and our construction planning, we should be able to have a complete set of plans for the parking ramp in the city's hands. That doesn't have to go through the SHPO. We should have that in your hands in three months. That would be coming right into the spring where we could begin the, the demolition of the, of the uh, 119 East 2nd Street property. And uh, because of the way that's going to be constructed with uh, concrete pillars, we can, we can do the engineering of that. It's, it's not a high finished uh, construction project. We think we can have that completed in three to four months. And the parking ramp should be open easily before the end of 2018. And that should be good for everybody downtown right away. That's on private property. That parking use agreement, uh, we intended to mirror our use of the, uh, of the West Park area that's why we've got the five days and the 30 days in there. For us, that helps us create a VIP experience for people who may be booking rooms and booking the event center at the, at the hotel facility. 
we think that's important to, to really bring in some, some wow and some big events with big crowds. We understand the concern about us not tying up that entire parking ramp. Uh, so that we think we came to a fair compromise on, on how to manage what's really a public facility that's on private property. And we know that's unique. And, uh, but we're comfortable that what is proposed here for that facility is is going to be good for all concerned and uh, so really our commitment hasn't changed this actually speeds up the process in our mind uh, we're excited we've got a lot of interest in in uh, in the details we want to frankly control the publicity on on a lot of the details of the hotel and who the people are we've had people making regular inquiries of us as to the how to get involved in the event space and how to get involved in the restaurant space, but we, we know enough to know we have to do things in a certain order. And uh, we, we stand here grateful, still grateful, still excited, and uh, still committed to make this happen. Pat, is there any scenario that you would envision that, you know, the it does say in here that the property could be reverted back to the city if things don't happen by August 1st. Um, if that were to occur, is there any scenario that you could envision that that would happen and there would not be a confluence involvement in this project? No. Nope. No, sir. Okay. Thank you. Is there any further uh, discussion or qu questions? Okay. Councilmember Balsano? Yes, uh, <coughs> thank you, Your Honor. Uh, just to say that your concerns are, are my concerns about, um, you know, this clause. I, you know, and when I heard John say this, it really turned my stomach that, uh, that Confluence could back out of this. Uh, and then we're right back to square one again after all of this investment that we've gone through, and then what do we do? Um, and, I, you know, I appreciate uh, Pat, what you're saying here that uh, you and your company are committed <coughs> to uh, to see this whole thing through, uh, and and I appreciate that very much. I I do have uh, just a couple of questions. The uh, the the uh, parceling out of the property into three different lots I guess we would call them right yeah uh, it, 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 uh, do you anticipate I mean I you know we we saw that parking lot that's uh, to the west of the building uh, on the north side of second street uh, you know pie in the sky or whatever do you foresee maybe parceling or selling those portions those two additional lots for other development then or is it your future plan to keep everything under your auspices then it is our plan be to create those lots so that we could have a separate lot that we could develop for future housing on the west side of the hotel or to expand the hotel if the demand would would uh, in indicate that that would be a good prospect for us. That's one of the reasons we like, we, we really like the idea of moving the parking ramp over to the bank site so that we preserve what is probably the, the more valuable develop, developable land with good views to the river but still not impacting the public park. It preserves, the other idea with that, those separate lots was to preserve the the public park aspect uh, in perpetuity for that to always remain a, a, a public use facility close to the river. The, uh, thank you. The, um, the other thing to just comment about is the, uh, I'm still kind of uncomfortable with the private land public ramp uh, situation. Uh, because it is so unusual, as you said. And I've picked up comments from people, especially the business owners downtown, uh, 
you know, when they're finding out that uh, there will be, what was it, five days? Where Maximum of five days per month. Five days per month. 30 days in any one year. Yeah. Uh, yeah, on, on, and, and that's, that's not on average. That's five days within a calendar month, right? right. No more than that. So you couldn't, you couldn't bank two days from June and use those two for July, and then you have seven and no, sir. so forth. So it's just stay at a maximum of five per month then. And uh, I, I've explained, as, as you have, because my, uh, my parents were in the restaurant business, mm -hmm. and uh, the same kind of a thing, if you're running an event, a special event, banquet, uh, whatever, then uh, 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 valet parking, you know, mm -hmm. VIP parking, whatever you want to call it, uh, is something that enters, enters into the whole thing. And um, uh, it, it, I'm mentioning this because, again, there was sensitivity about this uh, on the part of the downtown. Oh, my gosh, is he going to charge for the nights that we're running the car shows, you know, for example, or if there's a big concert down at the pavilion or something like that. So, you know, just to perhaps elaborate on that just a little bit more, so that uh, 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 the public is understanding that it is something that would be d tied directly to your business and not, not really anything tied to any other kind of event that would be going on downtown. That, that is our, our concept as well, is that these, these lower level stalls in that lower parking ramp, they're gonna be available to the public 335 days a year, no matter what, they're gonna be available to us to attract hopefully a big event or a big user to our hotel that I'm sure will help the rest of downtown as will those 99 stalls that are being created by this development. They will always be available to the public. So I think the net positive for everybody is really a net positive. We, we want to try to bring something that has a, a regional attraction and, and without the, the ability to give the board of directors of the Bus Operators Association, who's, I keep using them as, as an example, but we're coming after them. They're gonna have their convention in this hotel. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna probably need to give the board of directors of that group, uh, which I'm not on anymore, uh, VIP parking and maybe a hotel room or two and they're gonna come with 100 or 150 people and they're gonna spend three four days downtown Hastings and the people who make the decision for that group are gonna get a little bit of special treatment through via those 36 stalls furthermore if they need under if they need cover for the vehicles or the goods that they want to display as part of their convention or their show, uh, we will have that covered but still outdoor parking space available for them. It could be it could be a regional car show or an auction with cars that are worth a couple hundred thousand dollars each. Wouldn't that be nice to have down along the river for a week or so? But if you have a two hundred thousand dollar Packard, and I know a guy who does He's gonna want some protection for that, and, and that's what we're, it's gonna to take to attract that kind of, a, of an affair to the whole downtown, to the whole town, so. Well, having, having taken, uh, I believe, three tours now uh, <laughs> through the building, inside and out, uh, underneath and above, <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know, getting a real microscopic view of the whole thing, uh, what excites me is the banquet facility, uh, certainly the hotel, certainly everything else that's going on. But uh, what I've been telling the public is that this is going to be what you call a destination facility. Uh, uh, having had two daughters uh, who got married and uh, 
when they got engaged were asked, when are you going to have the wedding? And they said, oh, we'll kind of see, you know, uh, sometime in a year, year and a half. And then they went looking for banquet facilities and uh, the cart was running the horse, if I can kind of repeat that. But uh, the wedding was therefore centered around the banquet availability. Uh, and uh, th there's a huge uh, call for these kinds of facilities. Uh, and and uh, not just weddings, I, I see many conferences, mm -hmm. you know, like you're saying, uh, and so forth. Uh, we were just down, uh, uh, Cheryl Holmes, uh, piano instructor here uh, in the Prescott Hastings area. Uh, we were in Red Wing yesterday, I think for the 10th year in a row now, a piano recital uh, for her students, about 150 people in the banquet room, two pianos, lovely afternoon. And why, I, I, I've been sitting there for the last two, three years <laughs> saying, why do we have to get in the cars and go all the way down to Red Wing uh, when we could be here someplace in Hastings? And I'm just saying to myself, confluence, confluence. You know, I can see that recital program taking place there in addition to many, many other things as well. There was a day when I was there with our kids. I know exactly yeah. what you speak of. Yeah, uh, Cheryl Holmes, she's the H in M and H. That's right. Uh, if people don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it's, it's going to be a good marriage, I think. Uh, uh, I, you know, based on, on your track record and again, having been down to Louisville and taken a Cook's tour of everything that was down there with my wife. Uh, you know, and I came back and I wrote the paper and I said, you know, one word, wow. You know, and if, if we can come 50% as close as what's going on down there, uh, it'll be Goosebump City. So um, uh, I, I really look forward to this. I. I guess I'll believe it when I see it. I've been asking for two years, when are we gonna have a closing date? Uh, uh, John Hinsman's shaking his head. He, under he's, he knows how I've been you know, asking for this and the mayor knows this. He knows that I've been asking for it. Uh, and I understand that, uh, and again, SHPO, uh, the acronym for the State Historic Preservation Commission, uh, that that's who we're dealing with. And uh, uh, it, it uh, is remarkable the amount of patience that your group has had, you know, trying to deal with this entity. Uh, very disappointing that uh, this has taken as long as it, as it has, but really through no fault of yours. And with that, I will okay. yield the floor. Thank, Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, is there any further discussion? Councilmember Fulch. Honor, thank you. I'll try to be brief. Just this is the first opportunity that we've had to review these documents, and so just trying to quickly peruse them. And so maybe it, it would be nice if we had an opportunity, because I know we're getting kind of yeah, tired. Late. Yeah, to, to, to talk later. But um, I'm for as excited I am mm -hmm. as I am about what you're doing. I'm a little concerned about um, the the parking ramp um, maintenance agreement. Um, looking at this, it looks like the city would be um, subject to picking up 70% of the costs of maintaining the structure. And then we would have to provide um, the general liability insurance over the over it for the next 39 years. And, um, and, and, and it's a heck of a deal when, you know, it was a grant that's being provided the million and a half to be able to erect the structure. Mm -hmm. And so the only monies that have been put into it then have been the acquisition of the land property itself, the First National Bank, what is the First, yeah, First National Bank building site, which I don't have any idea how much that cost. But it just seems very lopsided that after 39 years that um, the property is yours or whoever, you know, you know has the property 39 years from now, and the city has nothing. And so um, I just find that that is a concerning use of taxpayer dollars. Um, and so I don't have the answers to that right now. I'd like to think about it more, but I just believe that, that that's concerning about what is 
Um, what, does the, what do the taxpayers get out of that in the end? Uh, so. I'll just give you something to counterweight just to give sure, it some no, thought. Sure, no, that's fine, yep. You know, when we discussed this early on, we thought, uh, uh, you know, do we have to do the maintenance of the whole thing? You know, we do maintenance in city parking lots all over the city of Hastings, which makes it different is this one's privately owned. Yeah. But the public is pri uh, but the parking is public. The 83 spots on the upper floor will always be public. Uh, their request for the five days to close it will, does not affect the upper level. So the parking that's available, that will be available to the public 24 seven and this ramp uh, will always be available. Uh, we did a calculation and among city staff says, well, if we go in there with our crews and go in there, it'd be about $100 a stall to, uh, to maintain it uh, on a year round basis. It's about, uh, about $75,000, $80,000 a year. Or, uh, no, excuse me, $8,000 a year. $8,000 a year. So, uh, you know, we felt, well, you know, we, we, we could have our crew go in there and do that, which is, which is uh, problematic because of the structure. Or since uh, Confluence is maintaining the lower half, it's, which is the reason why it's 70, because we're just doing the upper half, mm -hmm. uh, they're going to hire out the contractor. They're going to worry about the uh, snow plowing of the structure and stuff but the city's participation in lieu of our city staff doing it uh, would help provide for the uh, public spaces that would be provided 24 seven to have that snow cleared. So it was, a, it was an advantage to the city. This was some of, one of the, some of the things that we negotiated out that you see here. Thank you, Your Honor, and um, I that, understand what you're saying. That's the counterbalance. Yep, yep, if staff could actually provide in writing what the dollar amount that will be necessary out of the city's operating budget to be able to maintain this um, structure, I think that would be rather useful rather than just saying $100 a stall, because that, it's more than- That was their calculation. Yeah. Oh, right, but what does that mean? Okay, so 100 times, you know, whatever. 83 you spots. Know, 83 spots. Yeah, so, yeah, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8, $8,
construction timing because that's a big concern of everybody here, ours too. And I'd like us all, if we could, to think in terms of this building opening in phases. The hotel rooms take quite a bit more to build than the banquet facility, for example. So we don't know exactly what that looks like. It depends on the market and the demands that we, but if we can open up the, the banquet facility and generate revenue in 2018, you really don't want to open a hotel this time of year is what all the experts tell me. You're better off doing it in the summer or the fall at the latest, otherwise wait till the spring. And so that we, because of this extra three, four months of the SHPO approval and you extrapolate the real time it takes to build this out, that's why the, some of the dates are showing there, but that hopefully won't preclude us to getting maybe the park done and the, and the event space. And there may be portions of the building we'd be asking the city to help us op open up in phases. And that could help mitigate the, the uh, bond factor, which we understand is a, is a critical item here for the city. So that, that could help. Okay, well thank you and thank you Harrison and uh, Mike, thank you for being here and Pat, we appreciate that. Thank you for that. your we'll continued support. And, uh, this we'll have this before the council on the January 2nd meeting. Uh, you can look on this more and uh, look for uh, some votes at that time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, uh, council will go to our administration. The last item tonight: uh, resolutions regarding to the uh, 19 or excuse, 19, 2018 final budget levy and special levy. Uh, staff, uh, Melanie. Your Honor and Council, I will be brief. You have before you two actions, two resolutions: setting and approving the final Hedra HRA special levy as well as the 2018 final budget and final levy. These items have been before you a number of times over the last six, eight months. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions, but um, would stand for a vote as well. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, take before us uh, the 2018 budget. Council, we have that resolution before us. Uh, what's, your, uh, what's your wish? Councilmember Vaughn, motion to adopt. Seconded by Councilmember Brox, that motion is before the body. Is there a discussion to that motion? Councilmember Vaughn. Yeah, I just got to give a quick thanks to all of my colleagues here because I think I think we got good input from everyone here, and I think we represented the residents very well. Real real credit goes to the staff though because we did ask for some innovation, and um, we wanted them some efficiencies. And I think they gave us options when we started to look at the capital items that they wanted to uh, bring to us. So I think this budget allows us to to maintain. Uh, our assets that we have in the community and the service that we provide. So I think I'm happy that what number we came up with. Thank you, Chairman of the Finance Committee. Appreciate that. Is there any further discussion to the motion before the body? <laughs> Councilmember Fulch. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, yes, it has been a tremendous learning curve this last year. And so I thank staff for all their patience in um, providing really useful information as we've gone along. And um, just moving forward, I would like to see further development of the CIP so that was more thoroughly fleshed out as to really what's the five-year vision so that we can understand we um, really just looked primarily at the next year and um, there's very little that was said after that. It's my understanding that we have um, a facilities condition assessment that's been uh, provided by a vendor in the last year or so. And I'd really like to see um, what those recommendations were that were provided and how it is that that will be uh, worked into the CIP so we can get a better um, understanding of that as we're moving forward. How do we maintain our structures? Um, and then last, I'm, I am concerned that um, when I was looking through the packets, the packet this, um, this evening, I didn't actually see the final budget that in, in our packet. And so, um, then I realized there was a little notation that the proposed budget was online available, and so I pulled that up and started to look at it. And I just, I find it concerning that we're being asked to approve the 2018 budget without it being a final budget. And I, I guess I haven't um, seen other governmental bodies in the past actually do that, where um, you pass a budget but it's not a final budget. 
And so um, perhaps that's a precedence that's been um, conducted in the city in the past, but I, I wasn't aware of it. And so I was just looking for um, some um, advisement as to what has been the practice and, and how does that work if we're not approving a final budget and it's still a moving target, I guess. We're, what are we doing then? We're approving an amount in general assumptions about what's going to be um, within the various departments, and that's going to be finalized some other time, I guess. I no, was just you looking want to for explain How does this work? Sure. I'd be happy to. Your Honor and Council, the financials are final. The financials are what is, is in the budget when you looked online. Those, those numbers were the budget. What is not quite final is some of the narrative aspects of it. So that's why we have the draft notation on there. The financials are what the um, what has been presented and what is out there on the website. The the budget itself, the document itself, should be finalized. Here, um, I mentioned this to you earlier. Probably by the end of the year, um, first of the year, January second, I would expect you would have a paper um, budget available for you. I, I use the. Uh you know the online version as well when I was studying the budget before tonight so and I felt I felt informed uh, when I looked at it uh, so yeah that's member I felt thank you honor that um, council member Fulch takes me to a secondary question how would a citizen or resident um, get a copy of this preliminary budget without having access online how would can they come to City Hall can they come and request it do they get it at the front desk does it cost money yeah, we would make copies of all of that available. Absolutely. No cost? Yeah, I don't think we would. I'm, no. Yeah, I, I just want to make it clear that this, is, this information is out there and available. Um, and uh, so if any citizen wanted to come to City Hall and get a copy of it, they would get a copy of it. There's nothing secret about it. It's not locked up in a room somewhere. One of the things that helps us is uh, uh, once we pass the final budget tonight, that basically also gives staff the opportunity to put it in its final form and, and, and actually publicate, you know, have a publication that you'll be getting shortly in the new year. So, because it's, it's adopted. Okay. 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 Uh, we're on the motion on the. Uh, 2018 budget, all those in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The motion prevails. Uh, next, if I can find my version. Did oh. they do, was the motion for both the resolutions? Now, that's just for the budget. Right. Now we're going to go on to the next thing. The next thing is to adopt the final levy. That resolution was in your packet to adopt the, the levy. We've got two resolutions, Your Honor. Oh. I, I, thought, well, I was going to do that separate, but we wanted it in the same these resolution. Are, these are all together. Okay, they're all together. So this includes the um, uh, the uh, special the special levy. That's what we've asked to be okay. Done. Okay. Okay. So the special levy is the hedra is the hedra levy. Okay. I'll seek a motion. Councilmember Lund makes that motion to approve. Second by Councilmember Liefeld. That motion is before the body. Is there any further discussion of that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The motion prevails. And I get to the uh, most anticipated part of this evening. Comments from the audience. <laughs> Is there any comments from the audience? Okay. Okay. Seeing none, council announcements. Announcements. Seeing no announcements, I have a few announcements. Uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, December 19th at 7 p.m., the Heritage Preservation Commission has been canceled. Uh, on Thursday, December 21st at 6.30 is HEDRA. HEDRA uh, was going, is going to be rescheduled, so it will not take place this Thursday, December 21st. It's being rescheduled. It will be. It's the new meeting. It's that, the, that's oh. the rescheduled date. Now. Okay, it says HEDRA rescheduled. What so what they mean by that is, as I'm getting the interpretation, is that it's been rescheduled and it will be on Thursday, December 21st at 6.30. Am I correct? Okay, so Hedra, 6.30 Thursday, December 21st. I'm just reading what it says here. On Monday, December 25th, and of course Monday, January 1st, so it's uh, uh, Merry Christmas uh, Day on uh, Monday, December 25th, and New Year's Day, Monday, January 1st, the city offices are closed. On Tuesday, January 2nd, that will be our next city council meeting at 7 p.m. Um, 
We'd like to wish a happy birthday to Julie, right over here. Happy birthday, Julie. Okay. And another 29th birthday we're going to get to celebrate on, on that. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? Okay. Uh, uh, council and, 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 and to members, uh, condolences to Council Member uh, Mark Vaughn. Uh, Mark, I speak uh, on behalf of all of us here. Our condolences on the recent passing of your father. Uh, I lost my dad. I know how, how hard that can be. And uh, our thoughts are with you, Council Member, and your family and at this time of your loss. So we, w we wish you the best and your family. Uh, on behalf of the uh, city of Hastings, uh, we wish everyone a peaceful and safe holiday season, and we look forward to a great 2018 uh, when we'll be meeting next. Uh, Councilmember Leifeld. To verify, Nick, is the open house tomorrow night? It is, yes. Thank you. Could you give us some details quick, uh, please? 7 p.m. at uh, Our Savior's Church, and uh, our crack team of our city engineer mm -hmm. and his staff will be there welcoming the public from the neighborhood so if you could remind the public what what the meeting is involving it, yeah i'm sorry Thank it's you. the uh, uh neighborhood open house for the 2018 neighborhood improvement project yep. okay thank you council member uh tomorrow night from four to seven our savior's church uh basically ward two there uh for the road improvement project of 2018. okay there's no further business before this council motion to adjourn is in order Councilmember Vaughn makes that motion, seconded by Councilmember Leifeld. That's a non-debatable motion. All those in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The motion prevails, and we are adjourned. Thank you.